So last class we ended with the long-term causes uh, or beginning of the long-term causes. Uh, like I like last class um, we talked about the Japanese relations with the West, how Japan was isolated. It had feudalism, and even though they had some Dutch traders in, at the port of Dashima in Nagasaki, uh, they still were pretty much closed off. When uh, Commodore Perry came, right, he uh, used something called the gunboat, di gunboat diplomacy, which was, you know, you take a boat there, shoot at the Japanese, give them a white flag, tell them this is how you surrender, and the Japanese surrender, uh, being inspired by the power of Western technology. Why did uh, America and Ethiopia, Japan, for trade, for Manifest Destiny, because of the California Gold Rush, and just because they can with steam navigation. And so change was happening, and um, <coughs> Japanese were impressed. There was a case precedence in China when they lost the Opium War, and there was also that, that led to the that led to the Treaty of Kanagawa in 1854, where it essentially opened Japan up, which led to the Meiji Restoration. And this was all from last, this is all from last class, so you don't, you don't really need to take notes for this. Um, which led to a emperor-led modernization, feudalism to limited democracy, and they basically modernized. And where did they get their? Uh, where did they model their navy? Britain. Britain, yeah. The British had the best navy at that time, and they decided to model the British. How about um, their land Russia. military? Russia. 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 Yeah. Russia. Uh, not, not Russia. Germany. Russia. Prussia. It's Prussia. Actually, yeah, that's... Um, no, back then. By that time, it would be called Germany. Uh. Right? And so, today we're going to talk about... Sino-Japanese War and a Russo-Japanese War. And the question we're going to be looking at is how did the Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War prepare, uh, lead Japan down the road to war? I'll write the, I'll write the essential question down. Okay, here's the question. How did the Sino-Japanese War and the Russo-Japanese War lead Japan down the road to war in World War II? I used war four times in this question, but in this case, I guess it's, it's uh, acceptable. Okay, I'm going to continue. Yes. So, in the Sino Japanese War, Japan beats China. China previously was beaten by Western countries, Britain, France and all the colonial powers went and attacked China. China lost the Opium War. Opium. And back then it was, okay, China lost to the Western powers. Opium War uh, happened in the 1840s where, um, where Britain and China got into a fight because Britain was selling opium to China. Right? And then a lot of Chinese were inhaling. You guys know what opium is? Drug, drug. Yeah, it's a drug. You guys know how to make opium? That pot is the wrong pot. Well, that's not how you make opium. That's how you smoke opium. <laughs> you know how you make opium? Flower. It's what a flower. What type of flower? Yangtze. Well, I don't know what that is. <laughs> no, not green. Oh, no, it's the part they get get it from is green. Yes. 
You guys know where they get um, which flower it's from? Not in English. Lady's name. Yeah, um, think about um, think about Remembrance Day. Poppies. Poppies. Yeah. Oh. Poppy fields. There were actually a lot of poppy fields in um, Afghanistan and uh, India, I think, during that time, where they made um, where they made a lot of poppies. Well, oh, not made a lot. They planted a lot of poppies. And what you do is you take the you know the, the poppies. What color are they? Red. Red. Yeah, there's, there's the poppy flower, and the center of that poppy is, what color is it? Black. Uh, I think it's green. It's green? Green or black. Green or black. Well, I'm not, not exactly sure. So that part is where the, um, <laughs> the flower, the, the flower, the nectar of the flowers. What you do is you take that, and then you um, boil it, or you, you boil it, and just melt it down, break it down. Um, basically, uh, what's the term is uh, macerated, macerated, and then after you break it down, you filter it, get get rid of all the other junk, and the purified version of that is um, opium. And actually, a further more modern version of that, after you uh, purify it some more, if I if I remember correctly from my professor back in uh, back in college, it's um it, it's actually a mod, more mod. Uh, Opium was kind of an older form of um, heroin and morphine nowadays. Wow. Yeah. So, but so the effect is similar. You need to, and you need, and it's highly addictive. You need to take that into account. So, um, back in the back in the eighteenth century, seventeen hundreds, China was, you know, China was pretty strong. At least in their mindset, they were pretty strong, and in the East, they were strong. Uh, they were quite self-sufficient. China's big. China never really needed, felt the need to invade someone. Yes, I know China's fought with Korea and China's fought with their neighbors, right? But China has never, with the compared to the size of China and the ability of China, they actually attacked people relatively, you know, a few times. They didn't really. They, they've never really felt the need to invade a lot of their neighbors because they felt self-sufficient. Now, when the West came to China to trade, um, the, the Chinese, the West mainly, the main commodity that the West wanted was tea. They wanted cha, tea, right? And so, um, you guys, yeah, you guys remember if you guys remember your American history, uh, the British East Indian Trading Company, right? Yeah, that, that was a tea party, the Boston Tea Party. In fact, the tea that was thrown into the Boston Harbor was Chinese tea. And that's, 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 that's a very strange connection. And, and, and it's, it's interesting because when you think about China all, like, you know, all, all the way on the other side of the world, and how does it relate to the American Revolution? It has everything to do with the American Revolution because the British were getting Chinese tea and bringing it all, and the British needed to sell it. Um, they can't, you know, Britain alone can't consume it, so the British East Indian Trading Company forced Americans to purchase the tea, right? And so the Americans threw the tea out in uh, Boston Harbor as, as a form of protest. And so when you take that into account, uh, the Chinese uh, by that time were already trading tea. And the Chinese really didn't need anything. So what happened was um, basically a formal, a formalized narcotics trade where, um, and it's also called the triangular trade, we're not going to get into too much detail for this, where um, Britain essentially traded opium for tea in China. And the way the British could trade for that is um, send off, uh, because India was a colony, so the, Brit the British went to India, and then from India, they traded with China. So if you look at the formal records, um, it's most of the, most of the sh uh, ships came from India to China, and India was a major stop for them. But uh, if you look at the records, and so in Philadelphia, it's a lot of it's like you know India with China, but the real source of all that trade is in Britain. And at that time, it was you know there there are letters that are still available, and we're not going to look at those. But there are letters in which you know even the the prime minister and the queen recognize that yeah we're trading opium for tea. And so when you think about that, um, it's. There's something wrong with that. <laughs> when you want a country, 
right? And uh, and when a country is trading opium for TV or something wrong. Um, but and that's what the but that's what the Chinese wanted. And so that's the opium war. A long answer. A long answer to that question. Oh, China rejected. Uh, at, at some point, China, the Chinese had to decide to take a very strong stance against opium, and then they started to, you know, to throw out the opium, persecute those who traded the opium, because the government decided like this is bad for a country, and so they decided to crack down on it. And then, um, however, while while they were cracking down on some some of the some of the opium trades, some boats were um, chased after. You know, they chased the. British boats out of the harbor, and then um, some firing ensued, where and then basically broke into a war. The Chinese got whipped up, got whipped um, in no time, and so that was the end of the first opium war. There was a second opium war that happened, but we're not going to get into that. So that was the opium war, and the Japanese. Uh, Recognize that the West were able to beat China. They decided to modernize. After the Opium War, China was modernizing at the same time. So it's kind of like you have both streams of modernization going on. Michael is doing his extended essay on that. Right. So, in the, in maybe in a year, you can ask him. He'll be a specialist on this topic. Um, but essentially, Japan and China are both modernizing, and they're both racing to see who's going to um, be better. Uh, but the result was Japan successfully beats China. In fact, China does not stand a chance against Japan. A couple of reasons. Number one, China at that time, they were building something called uh, a, a summer palace. Right? Um, I'm, and I'm going to get out of this PowerPoint for a second. I'm going to show you some pictures. Just you know, built These one. are... So of, of, available online, and you guys have you guys heard of the Chi Shi Empress? Oh, yeah. Empress oh, yeah. of China during that time. The, the old lady. Old lady, yeah. The, the emperor, uh, she basically um, imprisoned one of the, the emperor, uh, the emperor during her reign, because she thought the emperor was harmful, doing harmful things to China. So she's like, okay, I'm gonna keep this guy under control because he doesn't know what he's doing and I'm going to rule China for him. And so basically he, uh, she imprisons um, the emperor and, and the emperor died the day before she died. So she probably killed him. Like there's no exact proof but it's pretty clear that she killed him before and then she died and she passed away the next day. But the, on the day she passed away, she um, appointed the next emperor and you guys know who that is? Henry Puyi, um, the last yeah. emperor of China, and there's actually a movie on it. Uh, we're not going to watch it in this class, but um, it's a it's a pretty long movie, two and a half hours, I think. But it was it's actually done quite well. It's called The Last Emperor, and um, the emperor was Puyi, and she was in power at that time. She, one of her projects during that time was the Summer Palace. Palace, uh, Beijing. I I, was, I just went there this last trip to Beijing, and it, I walked around and man, it was nice. Look at this, right? It's basically here you have a hill, and this is designed to be um, quite similar to Tibet. You know, Tibet that huge build, that huge temple. You, you have you guys seen have you guys seen pictures of Tibet? Yeah. And you guys remember that huge temple on the mountain? I forget the name of it. Uh, I don't know any of it off the top of my head. This was designed to be similar to that. And so here you have the Summer Palace being built. She, uh, one of the main things that she built was a Summer Palace marble boat. This boat there, here, it doesn't look so fascinating now, right? Because you know, with age and deterioration, and the Summer Palace was robbed a couple of times after. But this. Uh, you know, build, when you build a boat out of marble, it's costly. And the whole idea, you know, the idea behind building this boat was, you know, have you guys heard of the term? Um, I know what is it mean in uh, Chinese, 水能在就也能覆舟, which means uh, water can support a boat.